What's up, everybody? Welcome back to We Have Cool Friends. I'm your host, Nick Scarpino. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Manscaped and Keeps, but we'll get to that later. Uh, quick shout out to our Patreon producers, Mohammed, Mohammed, and Al, the Predator Tribesmen, for helping to make this show happen. We love both of you, and we hope that you stick with us forever. Our guest today is a person I am very, very delighted to talk to. Uh, you might know him from uh, AMC's The Walking Dead. Some of you might know him from Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Uh, others might know him from Goldberg's. Uh, I, of course, know him from uh, one of my favorite comedies of all time, Balls of Fury. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Dan Fogler. Hello. I'm assuming everyone's clapping when we do these podcasts, but you yeah, can't I can hear them because they're probably in cars. Yeah. Um, how you doing, man? You're you're over in Europe right now, right? Somewhere somewhere undisclosed location. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm in, I'm in London. <laughs> oh, you're I'm in London. London. Okay. I wasn't yeah, quite yeah. sure what. I wasn't sure if we were supposed to say you're in London or not. So I just I, I went out on a limb and, and just ruined that surprise for you. Um, is this a is this a podcast or a video cast? So a video, video cast and a podcast, but we do we do audio as well. Um, and so we like to screw with people who aren't watching sometimes. Just gotcha. uh, yeah. So if you want to slide in any sort of like screams or an occasional siren, just do it. It's super fun for people. Oh. Do you make cars. siren sounds like the guy from Police Academy? No, but that's amazing. And thank you for that reference because he sure. was always one of my favorites growing up. And I'm glad yeah. that he stuck with all 15 Police Academy movies. Yeah. He, uh, he always, yeah. Anyway. No, <laughs> that's okay. We can talk, no, we can talk about it. So j- just so you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with our content or not. We go off the, the rails a lot here, Dan. So if we end up just talking about Police Academy for 45 minutes, our audience will probably love that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Specifically, I assume you're a child of the 80s as well. Um, so I'm assuming yes. you have a lot of the same touchstones that I do, um, just based yeah, off for of sure. a lot of your inspiration from some of your work there. Uh, but before we before us get into that, I do want to talk to you about um, something you've got going on tonight, tomorrow night, and the following night, September 23rd through the 25th. You are hosting ClickSport1 over on twitch.tv slash crown. And I watched the trailer for this three-day uh, tournament of champions uh, This yeah. where all the streamers come together and they're going to be playing three separate games. How did this... How did this come together? How did you become a part of this project? <laughs> yeah, man. I um, It's funny because I did improv with these guys uh, and we made stuff a lot like, like 10, t- more like 20 years ago. We, we, we did this. He, the guys who are part of uh, the creation of this are from uh, like the, the UCB days. And okay. When we would start to, um, I don't know if I don't know if Andrew uh, took classes, but um, it's so funny. It's like we 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 kind of formed a team of guys that we would do sketch comedy with, mm-hmm. and um, and now you know, <laughs> twenty years later, these guys go on, and now they're like decision makers over at Twitch and Amazon. <laughs> so now it's like, I, it's so funny. So they called me up and they said, "Hey, we." we have the show that we're developing. Um, do you want to jump on board, play the host and, and help, um, um, you know, create the character. And, and, uh, so I said, yes, you know, what are you going to say? No, to your friends, uh, you know, and it, sounded, <laughs> and it sounded really fun. Um, and it was really fun. It was, I think, I think it has the potential to be really hysterical. Um, we put it together in a really short amount of time, but some of the funniest stuff like comes together like that. Um, and, uh, yeah. What did you think of the, what did you think of the trailer? I mean, it's, it's, it's from, I've done a ton of research on you, uh, over the last three days it, and I can say it's par for the course, I think for some of your more creative endeavors. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh-oh. you've got, you, no, 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 that's, that's, that's great. You've got a, a sort of, um, <laughs> spirited i think the word bananas comes to mind a lot of uh, of where your inspiration comes from and it's just always it's it, it was let's put it this way we i we watched uh my wife and i watched uh some of some of your uh independent stuff over the weekend and she was like you're gonna have a lot of fun talking to dan on monday <laughs> on tuesday i was like i know uh no it looks it looks bananas it looks off the rails and i love it i mean yeah. just starting from the costume where did, did you get to pick this costume what's going on with the and I then someone said listen, laser nipples was- <laughs> There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen here. So, um, you know, I had, I, I definitely had my inspirations and I, and I threw, I, I, you know, sent some inspiration their way. I basically said, um, 
you know, I, 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 like you said, I grew up in the eighties. My, one of my favorite Star Trek movies is uh, Wrath of Khan. Oh yeah. And because of Ricardo Montalban. This makes sense. And the, uh, what'd you say? This makes sense now. The open chest. Yeah, this is where exactly. we're going. <laughs> so, and, and I am doing this accent, which is such an homage to Ricardo. And, uh, you know, it's, it's my God. I think that uh, it was such a blast to, you know, sometimes you get to to pay homage to your favorite characters, and mm-hmm. and, and <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do here with this Zod character with with Ricardo Montalban and and Khan. Um, what it ended up being <laughs> is because because you know, there's uh, a lot of people. Um, there's there's a lot of people who are in the crew and they want to help. And they they want their input and they want to put their stamp on it. So. Uh, and at, at the end, what Zach turned out to be was, I would say, Zach looks like, it's kind of like, imagine Jeff Goldblum from mm. the Ragnarok movie had, a, like, like, got together with Ricardo Montalban from Wrath of Khan, and then they stumbled in on an orgy between <laughs> the cast of, of Tron and yeah. 300. And okay. then that all mixed together, mm-hmm. and then you get you get Zach. If that doesn't sell you on this, ladies and gentlemen, nothing will. <laughs> Make sure you check that out. September 23rd to the 25th over on <laughs> twitch.tv slash crown uh, nice. 5 p.m. Pacific time here. Um, dialing it back a little bit. So just I wanted to okay. talk to you a little bit. I mean, if we can dial that back, I think once that is out of the bottle, back after. you just let it go to the bar. Um you mentioned your your uh, experience in improv. I just I wanted to kind of go back to your origins and see kind of how you got your start in acting, um, and if you were more focused on improv like from the get go. Wow. Yeah. I how did I get my start? I was uh, I always loved improv. Um, like I my first connection to improv was like watching Whose Line Is It Anyway, and then oh, yeah. in high school, and then. Um, <laughs> And then like starting the first like improv, you know, you know, extracurricular class and doing like basically just doing our own version of whose line is it anyway. And then um, taking that into college and I did the uh, I went to Boston University and I did spontaneous combustion there, which was the improv group there, which was probably some of the best, best times of my life doing that. And then. Like I said, when I got out of college, it was UCB just to, to hone the skills a little bit. At, at that time, I was doing some stand-up comedy, too. Okay, I was going to ask you about that because I feel like you sh- at some point belong on that stage as well. Because <laughs> I can imagine you being a very, 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 very good at stand-up. I, uh, yeah, I, I, when I was doing stand-up at the beginning, it was to get... Um, uh, I heard that you can get a manager like that or you can get mm-hmm. you know some attention from agents and... And it was a good platform, so that's what I did. And I and were you doing that in Bo- in Boston or in New York? I did a little bit in Boston when I was in college, and then um, I went home to New York, and then I just did it all over New York. That's awesome. Um, and I did play Caroline's a bunch, which is like basically the pinnacle of New York. Um, and I did that for like two, two, three years until I got an maybe two years, and then I got a manager. Um, and then I got a lot of advice, which was um, because I, have you ever done stand up, man? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been doing stand up for about four years now. Uh, well, wow. I should say three and a half because thanks to COVID, all the shows have gone. But I've done a couple of Zoom shows and they're completely heartbreaking. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine yeah. doing stand up, but you no matter what happens, you can't hear the laughs. So just think oh, about man. that. That's what that's what that's what stand up during COVID is right now. <laughs> No, but that's the thing with all of the like late night shows and like, you know, you know, all the sh- all the shows that go in front of studio audiences and stuff like that. And you watch them now and you're just like, this is weird. This it's is- very weird. They just did the yeah. Emmys and I, I, had, I didn't watch it. Oh, um, no, I didn't watch it. Yeah. But I, I saw some clips from it and it's just a I mean, kudos to them for like trying to make it work right. but there was you know there was like 15 articles the next day of like the 12 most awkward moments from the Emmys and again it's not the not the producer's fault it's just yeah no there's a three second lag between you and, and when the joke's gonna land so how are you supposed to you, you know, know why this you know why this works because I'm I, I also started doing 
my I do a for my 40x podcast. I started right. doing video cast and and I think that this this kind of thing works because we're laughing and we're having a good time, you know, and as long as we're having a good time, it's like we're we're, we're the audience and the entertainer at the same time, you know, and I think that uh, for some reason that's that's holding up in this medium. Um, but yeah, anything that would like that's supposed to have like a studio audience or something. It's, it's, it's tough. Strange. It's so tough. I think that's, yeah. that's, that speaks to the strength of podcasting. Um, and thanks for mentioning that. I should have probably put that in your intro, but I'm unprofessional. No, man. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that is why I think, and I think a lot of people are, are gravitating toward this medium right now too, because you are getting that sort of personal touch. And I think specifically people feeling that they're out of touch with society or with other people, because they're not allowed to go near each other. I think it's incredibly important that, that we all keep doing this. Totally. Um, but anyway, going back, so uh, New York comedy improv. Was there ever a moment where you thought maybe SNL was going to be like the way for you? Yeah, I made a tape for SNL. Um, I was, yeah. You remember Doctor Katz? Remember that show? Yeah, yeah. The like, well was a squiggly do- one, right? Where they were all squiggly. The lines. Yeah. I was doing stand up, and you know Seinfeld was going on, and mm-hmm. everybody loves Raymond. Like I, I started doing S- Seinfeld right at the end of the time where it was very feasible to be plucked out of obscurity and put on, you know, some show somewhere, you know, Mm -hmm. just, just having a good set. And um, so, and same thing with UCB, like um, SNL was like, was taking people from UCB and right. So there was a lot of, it was very high stakes and there was a lot of, anxiety and i was really young and and um and i was really hungry i was i was funny but the thing about the that stand-up world was that i would have a it was so 50 50 i would have a good set and come off stage and look looking for high fives and all i would get would be like fucking dudes just being like i gotta follow that Fuck right. you, Fogler. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and that—that's what I got uh, like half the time. Then the other half of the time, um, I would have a a bad night, and people were just like, "I can follow that." <laughs> you know, it's just like you know what I mean. It sounds very so, familiar. Yeah, yeah. It, it it was such a dark thing. Um, well, that was back in the time when, yeah, like you could. I mean, imagine what what time period we're talking here, just for context. Like that was. Um, 99 2000 2001 okay. yeah yeah that was still then, probably yeah. in, the, in the time when when that was happening i think i think now comedy is so it's so much more into the mainstream that i think there's it's so much more saturated with i mean every <laughs> club that's anything has uh you know 100 comics just waiting there to try to get on stage so i think maybe it's not quite as getting the visibility on your sets is not quite as easy as it used to be but yeah that that process is brutal of stand up and i don't but wish yeah, it yeah. on anyone <laughs> It was all about making tapes, make make a stand up tape, send it to SNL, make a tape of characters, send it to SNL. Um, and it was brutal, man. I had I had a, a couple <laughs> uh, agents and managers to begin with that you need to like have like a mid level agent and manager mm-hmm. put their stamp on you because then that's somebody verifying you, you know, and, you know it's like you're it's like your blue stamp on twitter or something you know it's like this person says you know i'm 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 legit you know i'm viable i'm a viable you know source but uh the there was a lot of um i I was a lot of you ever seen broadway danny rose (laughs) that's like that would you gotta see that it's a that would sum up a lot of the 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 stuff that you have to go through. Well, I imagine it's a like nightmare. For, I mean, for instance, I'm sure. sorry, say it again. No, I, was, I imagine it's probably a nightmare to try and get yeah, through. Just to, just to get seen. Like you say, make a tape for SNL. I remember, I remember I was with my agent and I'm and at the time and she was telling me, make a tape for SNL, make a tape for SNL. I'll send it in. And that's like one of the reasons I signed with her. And then um, she, now we're getting into like nightmare working your way up stories. So I make the tape, this mm-hmm. fucking VHS tape, you know, and I, I put it on her desk and um, 
she says, Oh, you made it great. She takes it and I leave. I, I, I come back and I, I don't hear anything. I don't hear God. Anything. <laughs> a month later, I come back, I'm sitting in her office and I'm, and she's like, so, um, you know, uh, nothing's really coming in, you know, nothing's really going on, uh, right now. And, uh, I was like, did you send in my SNL tape? She goes, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And then, um, I remember I just see right over her shoulder on the shelf behind her was my tape. Aww. My tape was still sitting there. And that's when I knew I was just like, yeah, I don't know. This is, there's some people that um, they talk a big game and, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a trap. And if you can't recognize the trap, you're going to get stuck. You know, I'm so oh, yeah. sorry. Continue. My no, you good. What were you I was going to say, no, I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to a number of people that, that, you know, have enjoyed, you know, a fair amount of success. And a lot of people say like most of it you're doing on your own steam. Like these, a lot of the people that come into your stratosphere are just sort of there to, to be there, talk the big game. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't know if that's been your experience, but I mean, just based off of how busy you are at any given time <laughs> from, from the stuff I've read about you, it seems like you're not going to sit there and wait for other people to do the job for you. No. No, I get very restless and that's where stuff like um, the things I've directed, <laughs> they, they come out of necessity and my need to um, be creative and my need to frankly try to create a vehicle to, you know, put myself out there for, mm -hmm. you know, as many, <laughs> whatever years there are that I'm not working, you know, there were definitely uh, some like after balls of fury Um there was uh, uh, a dip in the career, you, you might say, uh, between <laughs> between that and uh, Fantastic Beasts and some television stuff. And so I was basically um, just, you know, creating my own work uh, yeah. for, for a couple of years there. Um, and uh, which is great. You, you have to do that. You have to. Like, it's it's so important. Um, because you do the, you do those projects, you grow and then, uh, and you meet people and you do things that you, that you, you know, bring to the next job. It's all, it's all of it's relevant, you know? Yeah. Um, I have a theory that, cre that, that creativity, when you put creativity out in the world is never wasted. You know, you, it may not come back the way you think it is, but getting it out there is the most important thing. Um, so m moving sort of along here, uh, the next sort of thing that I want to talk to you about was the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, um, right. which, which you were in the original cast for, correct? Oh yeah, man. Yeah. That that's was crazy. <laughs> yeah, How did that come the, about? Yeah. That that's man. That was like kismet. Another one of those. So I was, uh, so I'll tell you the quick version. So I went to college. Well, fuck. I went to high school with Rebecca, Fel uh, with Liz Feldman who wrote um, dead to me got nominated recently oh cool her sister is rebecca feldman who i would watch in high school plays and um i go to boston university i meet sarah salzberg um and <clears throat> i'm doing ucb with sarah and rebecca calls us up one day and and you know, when you're when you're trying to get noticed and you're sitting around waiting, like it's the same thing. You're it's you're it, that was at a necessity. We had a bunch of improvisers sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> and Rebecca said, hey, um, we're doing she would do these improvised shows every once in a while. And some of them were hysterical. Some of them were flops. And this was another one of those things. And she was like, hey, we're going to improvise a show around this time there's going to be a spelling bee oh, and awesome. um some some characters are going to be um you know the the announcer and the vice principal and and but a lot of characters a lot of you guys are going to be you know fucking 10 to 13 year old kids and and so i was like oh shit so <laughs> um and i thought that was really fun um and they said for the audition it was uh, bring in two characters um, that are from your childhood, you know, part of you, you know, part of your growing up. And I basically brought in two characters that were 
um, to improvise with. And I, and the two characters that I brought in were both different, like versions of, uh, me on, on, on the spectrum of my personality. The first character was more like a couldn't sit still ADD kind of character. Um, and very silly means well, um, maybe, uh, has a, is, you know, has maybe Asperger's or something, mm -hmm. you know, uh and but that and it's funny because that character kind of became something else later and, and i think that's like uh the, like the prototype for the coney bear character but the other character i brought in was mr uh mr barfy or M mr barfay you know and mr barfay was the other side of the spectrum which was like my more cerebral side um like a and the allergenic side, you know, like growing up, you know, uh, the growing pains, you know, all mm -hmm. the stuff I put in the getting bullied and all that. I put that into that character and that's the character that they chose. Um, and so I'm improvising with that character and every, so all the characters were chosen and we, we start improvising the spelling bee show, which was basically, if you saw the Broadway show, um, this was basically the same structure. Um, there was some music and dancing, but it was more like, you know, pop culture music. Mm -hmm. And, and um, were you pulling from it, the audience as well during that? Absolutely. Yes, that was, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was all it was. We pulled that. That's that was a huge draw. People love to do that. They love to be part of the show. We, that would give me so much anxiety having to spell something in front <laughs> of other people. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we gave them if we, you know, it was that was some of the best stuff because we give people easy words and then sometimes we get a really excellent speller and we couldn't get them off and the audience <laughs> would go ape shit for that. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, because there's like that's one of that's one of us, you know. And mm -hmm. that was the best stuff. Always the the stuff that was unexpected. That's always and, a, that's always a, like a wild card though pulling anything from the audience. I mean, I know just from the years uh, I've done stand up that anytime you throw to the audience, it's always like, how's this going to go? What's going to happen here? Absolutely. I mean, and that aspect went all the way through to Broadway. Um, being in, uh, like, there was a night on Broadway because we still we brought people from the audience to be and we treated on, them like kids on Broadway. On Broadway. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And one night <laughs> we were going. One night we had a crazy night. One of the girls um, uh, got sick backstage, and we needed to buy time for her uh, stand-in to s fucking switch into the costume and run out on stage again. And during that time, the vice principal, uh, Jay Reese, who was also one of the originals, you know, the show was in his hands. So he basically says, uh, is anybody in the crowd, uh, you know, want to get up and spell stuff for a little while? David, David Hasselhoff Shut raises up. his hand. Yeah. So now That's it's... Now we're Amazing. sitting on stage watching David Hasselhoff <laughs> just, you know, spell random words for fucking five. Uh, how minutes. is the Hoff at spelling? Was he good? They actually nailed he the words. Was, he was mostly just like, you know, postponing spelling the words and just like reminding everybody of what he's doing now. He basically used it as a moment to advertise his career at the moment. Smart man. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> and and like, so surreal. And and so, I mean, he, it's crazy. We're improvising the show off, 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 Broadway. Sarah Salzberg, who I went to college with, is in the show. She's Schwartz and Grubinier. Just because, I just have to say this point. Simply because her other job was na a nanny for Wendy Wasserstein. Okay? And Wendy mm -hmm. Wasserstein is a, pl a playwright. Because she was doing that job just to make money to make ends meet on the side. She invited Wendy and the rest was history. She knew Bill Finn, James Lapine, boom, boom, boom. And that was it. We were off and to just found the place. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? And then, and then it goes and then you guys, I mean, obviously everyone loves it and you guys get nominated for Tony awards, right? Yeah. <laughs> Did you think when you, I mean, you won a Tony award if I'm not mistaken, right? For, yeah. for this character. Did you think that when you were in, when you were just screwing around pulling random audiences uh, when you were off off Broadway that you would get to rub it in your friends' faces that you, you're now a Tony Award winning actor? <laughs> that I, shows my psyche, by the way. That's my first thing that I think. When Tony, <laughs> rub it in my friends' faces that they don't have one. 
because I messed up. You know what? Because <laughs> that's a really se- cool distinction to have. I mean, that's that's I like send that's you, high honors. I will send you my Tony so that next year you can walk around and tell your okay. friends and say, you guys didn't see the virtual Tony Awards that oh, I won a Tony? Please, God. I will let that. you have my please Tony. Please don't though. do that. That's, that's, this is that's one of my coworkers, Kevin. Uh, yeah. He's never won an what. award, but he's talked about it so much. I've been trying to win a – Dan, I've been trying to win a Streamy. I've been trying to win a Daytime Emmy. Anything that's just gives me a little bit of an edge above these yeah. jackals that I work with. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll Emmys. Take it. You know what? Emmys are good for the apocalypse, too, because they're sharp. Yeah. Point. <laughs> get a, get away um, from my award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of our uh, coworkers, Greg, who I think is still on the call, but he's probably not listening. Won uh, something called the Trending Gamer Award back in, I think at this point it was like 2001, 2002. I don't know. But the damn thing was it 2015? I don't know. Um, but the damn thing is like 500 pounds and it's got a lot of sharp edges. So we do keep it as a paperweight, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> moving, also, move. What's up? Tim won a 30 under 30, you know? You're yeah, but, but we don't. That again, that's why I'm saying, how do I win a Tony? How do I win a daytime Emmy? I'll take, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, so going from there, do you, does that does the, the Tony Award get you a little bit more juice to, to expand your career horizons? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, no, it was, uh, no, it's definitely a prestigious thing. Um, like, that was, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, yeah. Um, yeah, that it opened like okay. There's a certain timeline there, so I got nominated for the Tony Award, and then I started getting a lot of television offers, and then I won the Tony Award, and then I started getting film offers. So you That's know, whatever, awesome. however, whatever that means, you know. Um, and then my very first choice was Balls of Fury. <laughs> hey, so uh, yeah, Bless so, you so for that. hey, listen, listen. Um, what was I going to say? No to to Christopher Walken and. And uh, ping pong. Hey, everyone, we're going to take a quick break to tell you about our sponsor, the first of which is Keeps. Listen, as guys, so much of our identity is wrapped up in our hair Uh, from how it feels after getting a fresh cut to uh, to the way it's perfectly styled before going out. That's why when we get into our 20s and 30s and start noticing the first signs of hair loss, it definitely feels like panic time. Uh, Let's face it. No guy is ever ready to go bald. Thankfully, there's Keeps, the simple and easy way to keep your hair. I can speak from uh, experience on this. Mid-20s, I started noticing it, and I freaked out, and I wish I had something like Keeps back then to help just guide me through this process because it's very, very scary. And if you're going through this, I urge you to check out Keeps as well. Uh, did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? The best way to prevent hair loss is doing something about it while you still have hair left. You can get treatment straight from home. Uh, you used to have to go to the doctor's office for your hair loss prescription. Now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered right to your home. They make it easy uh, and deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. Uh, uh, Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but probably never for this price. Uh, Listen, ladies and gentlemen, prevention is key. Keeps treatments uh, typically take between four to six months to see results, so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. Find out why keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and more than a hundred thousand men trust keep for their hair loss prevention medication keeps treatments start at just ten dollars a month plus for a limited time you can get your first month for free here is how we do it ladies and gentlemen if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss go to keeps.com slash morning to receive your first month for free that's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash morning again keeps.com slash morning to get that offer next up ladies and gentlemen we have manscape uh do you have a moose near the caboose that needs to be tamed i don't know if it's a good or bad thing but i sure do manscaped uh i am talking hairy big and need some support thankfully our sponsor over at manscaped has you covered to keep the hair looking nice and trimmed and feeling fully supported. Manscaped offers precision engineering tools for your family jewels. Uh, Beluga, did you hear that? That's your moose asking for Manscaped. Um, the Manscaped engineering team just perfected the greatest ball hair trimmer ever created, the Lawnmower 3.0. And let me tell you guys right now, if you're not manscaping, you should. Nobody wants to take off any sort of clothing and just get, you know, just shocked by it. 
whether it be physically or emotionally. So definitely check out Manscaped. The premium lawnmower 3.0 is waterproof and includes an LED light and is made with advanced skin safe uh, technology, which reduces nicks and cuts on your delicates. You can get this trimmer inside their perfect package 3.0, which also includes the Manscaped Cool Up. Manscaped Crop Preserver, <laughs> I don't know why I read it like that, Ball Deodorant, and the Crop Reviver Ball Toning Spray, um, both super practical, and they smell great, too. Plus, uh, for a limited time, when you order the Perfect Package Kit, you get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafe Boxer Briefs. Uh, the Manscaped Anti-Chafe uh, Chafing Boxer Briefs might be one of our favorite parts of this collection. Uh, the Manscaped Boxer Brief have optional temperature control with their crop cooling technology while keeping your pride and joy supported. That's very important if you're a sweaty guy like me and Kevin. Uh, the waistband is also super elastic to reduce chafing and rubbing. Uh, plus, when your girl sees the logo, she'll know. She's got a real manscaped man. Pair these boxer briefs with the pH balance liquid product like the crop preserver, and you're ready for anything. Uh, you need to try this out for yourself. Here's how you do it, ladies and gentlemen. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code morning at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use that code morning from the moose to the caboose. Always use the right tools for the job. Now back to the show. Um, can I ask you this question before we go into Balls of Fury? Because I think now is a natural time for it. Christopher Walken comes out on 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 screen for the first time, dressed how how he's dressed, <laughs> and his first line is "Okie dokie, artichokey," and then he says, "What is my favorite line in any comedy?" He says, "Ping pong," or as the Chinese call it, "ping pong." Were you there on set that day, and was it impossible to not laugh at anything that he did? Oh, I cherish <laughs> my time with Chris. Yeah, I learned that um, <laughs> I because I was honing my I was honing my impression of him. But I learned that, you know, I, I basically I was like, hey, man, how do you feel about <laughs> how do you feel? I was like, hey, Chris, because he was so nice to me. And basically, I, I was with him for the last like fucking 25 percent of that movie. I was just hanging yeah. out with him. So that was that was just so cool. Um, and I said, hey, Chris, you know, how do you feel about everybody in, <laughs> and their grandmother having an impression of you? And he goes, he goes, you know, Dan, it's fine. Jay Moore. Jay used to do an impression of me. It was good. But never do it. Right before a take, Dan. Never do it right before a take. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, no, no, never, never. never do that. And he and he says, he says, Jay, Jay did it all the time. He's not <laughs> around anymore, is he? No, no, that's fucked up. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he, yeah. So I knew that he didn't, he didn't, he didn't like. So there were times where I would be like. He would come off set. He would say stuff like that, ping pong. And I would be like, oh, my God, Chris, the way that you said. Mm, rah, rah. And I, I, I wouldn't be able to do the impression for him. I'd have to turn it into some other thing. Right. And he'd look at me and just be like, yeah, thanks for the feedback. But um, there would be guys who would be like in corners doing their impression of him from that day. God. And we would be like. Oh my God, did you hear when he said this? And then Chris would be walking up and all the guys would be like, cheese it, run. And, <laughs> and he'd be like, hey, where's everyone going? Um, that happened all the time. Because we knew that he didn't like, he didn't like, he said, he said, Dan, he said, Dan, I'm an Academy Award winning actor. How is my walking right now? It's weird. It's, it's weird. great. It's spot oh, on. Thank you. Yeah. He goes, Dan, I need that. I need that kind of. It's yeah. perfect. You get you're nailing the sort of like when it goes high, it disappears for a second up in the upper octave and then comes back <laughs> down. That is the, the two things that I've noticed because I, I I love one of these days because I have a lot of friends uh, who are very more more talented than me that do great walk ins. I want to do a walk in off when everyone's Ooh. in L.A. where yeah. it's we get everyone that does great walk ins and we go we rent out the belly room of the comedy store and try to get Christopher Walken to actually judge it and give an award for who does the best walk-in. I've been pimping this for years. We'll make it work when you're, when you're done filming unbelievably high budget, amazing movies for Warner brothers. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, continue. <laughs> I forgot. I went on that tangent. What was I saying? Oh, he goes. Oh, you're talking uh, about. Yeah, he goes. Um, oh, 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 yeah. He goes. He goes. He goes. Then. Um. He goes. Then I won an Academy Award. I don't know how many. He probably won several. He goes. Then I'm an Academy Award winner. But no matter where I go in the world, I can be in Nepal. And a little kid will run up to me and go, more cowbell. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he goes, he goes, I love SNL, but that's all they remember me now. It's all, that's all they remember me that's for. That's amazing. But I mean, you, he has to have an amazing sense of humor about himself, obviously, because he's, he chooses projects that are just so wide in variety. Things like Balls of Fury. Obviously, he had fun doing SNL. He has to know how much he has transcended that pop culture barrier, right? Yeah, he's he's got a... I think he's got like a godfather role in him coming up soon, you know? Yeah. He's not done with his excellent, excellent dramatic work, I don't think. But yeah, he chooses some, <laughs> some wacky projects. So, but I mean, guy. he was in Joe Dirt for crying out loud, and he's yeah. great at it. Don't get me wrong. This is no disrespect to Joe Dirt. It's 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 a guilty yeah. pleasure of mine for sure. But he literally, he's just, it, it just appears to me that the man shows up on, on, on set and just wants to have fun and screw around and just, he turns in just stellar work every single time. Listen, uh, they said to me, listen, Dan, it's a movie. It's called Balls of Fury. I was like, wait, 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 what? You're going to wear short shorts and a rhinestone jacket the entire film. And I'm like, wait, wait, hold on, wait, nah, nah. And they're like, Christopher Walken. I was like, I'm in. I'm doing it. I'm in. Got it. No problem. I'm in. They're like, ping pong? What? Fuck it. Christopher Walken? <laughs> I'm there. That's how I was like, that's that's it, man. He's like my one of my favorites. Oh my so not God. just but not just Christopher Walken. Let's let's dial it back a little bit. This has a phenomenal cast. I mean, you're co you're co-starring opposite uh, George Lopez, Maggie Q, um, <laughs> and James Hong, who yeah. I have to ask. Hollywood at, history there. At any point, did you did you pull him aside and ask him <laughs> about Big Trouble in Little China? Um, yeah, I mean, what's crazy? <laughs> what's crazy about James is that, I mean, he was in Chinatown, okay, with Jack Nicholson. Yeah, yes, okay? he was. He has been in a lot of stuff. I like. I would be if I so, met him. I would legitimately yeah. be super intimidated. I, well, I was. I was just constantly interviewing him on all, you know, all of his work all the time. And, and he was, I was just so fascinated with him because I mean, he's hysterical, but he was in that movie and in that movie, <laughs> you know, he's, he, I can't believe his, his energy is insane because in balls of fury, he's in his nineties, maybe. Okay. Is he really? Wow. Yeah. Or late eighties. Yeah. Come on. Um, and he's, you know, dancing around, he's, you know, hitting the jokes. And he was just, he was so funny in that. And, and um, yeah, man, I asked him about everything. I asked him about and he um, yeah, he was he was talking to me like he was he was there. He, he was, he had, you know, he had that, you know, he, the guy's got uh, uh, he's going to outlive all of us. But um, yeah, he was saying that um, that movie. um was crazy that he he loved doing uh he loved the the like big the sorcery character. yeah, yeah he, he loved all the makeup and you know the the heightened characters um yeah that's awesome. uh, I, I think i'm gonna have him i gotta have him on the on my oh, show you gotta I'm, do that i don't know if you're a big trouble little trying to fan i assume you probably of are. course yeah Fuck yeah yeah you just need to do you got to have him on there and just ask him about that because that is that is one of my all-time favorites for me of course another another cult classic turned real classic but um that's that's awesome so so you're doing that you're working with obviously maggie q as well which well, you, maggie I, q i yeah i love maggie we just you just um, worked together again right yeah we just did this movie it's out now it's called the argument um with uh robert schwartzman um and uh it was a director and man it's it's really funny it's it's out now uh if you like those um ensemble comedic um you know a lot of a lot of 
physical comedy clue and noises mm-hmm. off and you know soap dish those kind of like big character ensemble soap dish. Cats. amazing yeah, yeah. that is a great pull yeah it's an it's an homage to that those kind of movies that i grew up watching that i love um and maggie yeah man we're we're trying to she's coming on the show um this weekend on the 26th i don't know when this comes out but we're um, she's coming on the show we're going to do a whole argument um talk back basically with her and some other members of the cast well, she and i have been talking about uh maybe getting the gang back together and you know putting doing another balls of fury don't tell, don't do this to me i need <laughs> this please do this it's the time the time yeah. is now yeah we need i mean to that the, the world you've built is so is lush is lush for uh for the taking you gotta, we gotta get... do it before we gotta do it while james is still around and chris is still around and yes you know, please yeah. And uh, speaking of just that real quick, so how do you, so you come to that project? Obviously, this is a, this is written and directed by uh, well, written by Thomas Lennon and then directed by Robert uh, Ben Garrett, right? Yeah. Are these guys just insane to work with? Because I have to imagine that Thomas Lennon is just like full of energy. Oh my god! Yeah, they both are. Um, they're con- the the two of them are um, just like on the show, like on the Reno show, and mm-hmm. I've been watching them, you know forever doing they they'd had the state you remember they, they yeah you know, they, they they've they've been doing sketch comedy for a long time these guys and uh and they write I, a ton as well they they're yeah. like he's a uh, thomas specifically is hugely prolific as a screenwriter i actually read his book on uh how to write hollywood screenplays and the only thing i remember it uh from it is that he said that if you if you're good enough at it you can get your own yacht that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so i was like okay cool well that's good inspiration right, sorry anyway, yeah. yeah why um, not he uh yeah these guys they i feel like they've just been working together for since you know they're friends and they've been working together from since like college and it, it shows it's like they they finish each other's sentence sentences and um yeah that was a i i appreciate anybody that has the balls to <laughs> um to do uh sketch comedy and consistently keep coming back with sketch comedy shows and redeveloping and and coming back in a world of snl you know Mm -hmm. um anybody that tries to go up against that and um without the snl blessing you know you gotta you gotta support that and um these guys and they love wearing short shorts as well they love wearing Big short shorts fan as he wears in this and Rito and everyone won. Um, I, I, I mean, you've, my, my, my mind is blown. If there is any eventuality where balls of fury two comes out more balls, more fury or whatever you're going to call it. I am all in. I will promote that on all of our shows across the board. And you just tell, you tell me how we can help. And we at kind of funny will help as well. Um, I want to ask you a question here though, because I was looking around and I didn't see it. So the one thing that we need to get this sequel off the ground is you need to have a name for the fan base. You know how people call their fans something where it's like uh, we call our fans the best friends because like when you're hanging out with us where everyone's hanging out, it's like hanging out with the best friends. Um, you know, I, we got to come up with a name for the diehard fans of Balls of Fury right now. Something that can make the Wikipedia. Ooh. And I'm thinking something like Ball Boys but that's not really inclusive. So maybe ball boys and ball girls, but that's too long. Oh God. Yeah. How about, uh, how about fury force? See, I go with the, Oh, oh you I'm go always with avoiding. I'm always trying to avoid the, the balls part of this, <laughs> but the balls are where the power comes from. The balls is where all the comedy comes from fury force. It is. There you go. That's perfect. Um, you know, I have you for a couple more minutes. I do want to talk to you about some of the, the stuff that you've done independently. I'm obviously, any any anything you want to share about fantastic beasts i don't want to we can talk about that later but i do want to talk to you about hysterical psycho first nice. this is so this is you put together uh well stage did you watch it i did i watched it did you watch the black and white version or the or the color version no i was i was confused because i thought it was supposed to be black and white but i found it on amazon and it was all in color except for one scene that was very red for a while and then ended up coming back down what yeah oh, fuck so very red <laughs> yeah there was yeah. one thing where they open a door and it's very red and oh. then it just slowly. i think that was i think that was supposed to be done that way though 
So you wanted this to be, but this is your independent film that you wrote and directed. Stylistically. Um, yeah, yeah. With your, with your theater group, Stage 13, right? You got it. Right. Um, right. Stage 13, theater group. <laughs> okay. So that, <laughs> where did that movie come out? Oh, so I had a theater group. Um, we still kind of have one, but, you know, we're all dispersed doing different things now. Um, but right out of college, we had this troupe. And I, um, and as things started to cook with my career, um, I would utilize them, you know, and, and, and put them into things kind of like the Mercury players, you know I mean, like, yeah. you know, with Orson Welles, like we were trying, trying to, to do that. This I, neither of my movies are Citizen Kane, not at all. But, uh, I but, will say though, there is a depth to those films that uh i that maybe eludes me but that means that there's something there you know what i mean <laughs> okay that's nice of you to say um yeah that's very diplomatic of you the okay so you have to watch you have to watch the black and white okay version of hysterical cycle to really understand what i was trying to do there that movie came solely out of and i love that movie that movie came out of um i was handed a script um, I think it was called the number 13 and it was about young Hitchcock. It was kind of like, and I was going to play a young Hitchcock mm -hmm. and you know, that movie Shakespeare in love. Mm -hmm. Um, it was kind of like Hitchcock in, in love where okay. you see him as a young, um, director trying to find his voice and you see the impetus for all of his different movies, you know, um, different characters as in his life. Very similar vibe. It was a fun movie with, you know, you and McGregor was going to be in it. Like it was, it was all set up, ready to go. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, the money fell out of it. So then I'm in preparation for that before the money fell out. Um, and I think they're still trying to make that movie. I don't know if they'll ever make that movie, but there was a time where I was like, holy shit, I'm, I'm going to play young Hitchcock. <laughs> I was like, awesome. Oh, I was like, that's wow. a tall order right there. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, okay, Dan, you have to at least direct something. <laughs> you have to direct a movie, you know, just to, just to get in the headspace. Yeah. So that was hysterical psycho. I was like, okay, you're going to do your, your psycho, your black and white crazy movie with your friends from your troop, kind of like an homage to Orson Welles at the same time. And, um, and, it was, uh, you know, it's more Mel Brooksy, and you know, it's filtered. Oh, yeah. It's filtered through my my. I basically, it's an that movie is an homage to everything that I love. Like there's there's Mel Brooks moments in it. There's fucking Jaws moments in it. You know, oh, yeah. there's like fucking crazy. You know what I mean? Like like uh, the Woody character is basically like my my homage to to Quint from Jaws. You know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the the killer um, hysterical psycho is like, basically it could be an origin story for the Joker. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, it, it's very, um, it basically it is, it's, I just put everything I loved in it for my first movie. It all takes place. These, this troop goes up to, um, to this place called Moon Lake. Moon Lake is my homage to the show Lost. Okay. So it's this place and the Twilight Zone and and uh, it's a place that's this place from time. You go there and you can't get out, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's very, very haunted. And uh, and then these these friends go there and they all go crazy in their own way. And the killer goes crazy in his psychotic way and kills everybody, um, you know, classic, crazy fun yeah, your fun horror movie. fair yeah yeah and the cabin in the woods kind of thing but that when i finished that i had such a great time making it you know the movie is what it is it's very it's very student filmy in a lot of it's, places and it's it's surprisingly fun i mean I yeah it's surprisingly fun but did, you can definitely see especially if you're a fan of film like oh where a lot of just the the references come from right um and i like i don't know why um I apologize for watching the the color version. And I, I knew that it was supposed to be black That's and white. That's all it's but out there. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, I couldn't find the black and white version, but I think it probably would have played better in black and white as well. Because I can you... send you, I can send you it, man. Oh, that'd be um, great. I would love to check that out. Um, yeah. Cause I just, did you guys shoot it in black and white or did you shoot it in color and then? We shot transfer? it in black and white. Well, we How shot they... it. No, no, we shot, yeah, what did we do? I mean, you, we shot it in both, you know? So yeah. it was like, um, we had the option to, but it looked, we didn't, we shot it in, we, for, we lit it for black and white. So yeah, yeah. When they said, no, 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 black and white's not selling. We want, we want color. We were like, oh God, all right. Like, desaturate take the filter off you know whatever the fuck right. we were doing and then it was like yeah yeah you know it's like that's what we ended up with you know not I'm, I'm not selling it very well but it was always it was it's it looks like um it's got its own quirkiness the color version and the charm it's just like you know you, you obviously appreciate it but oh, for I, sure it, it was always meant to be black and white I think um, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I think specifically a lot of the a lot of the imagery, if it were black and white, would probably make me think a little bit more of like old Twilight Zone episodes. Totally. Spe- you know, there's moments in it that are very much Norman Bates, so I think those things would have. I, I understand why black and white would have been the thing for you. How um, do you how do you find funding for this, or how do you find how does this project like come about? Because you this was a pretty extensive shoot, right? Yeah. Well, we yeah. I mean, <laughs> how much was the full budget for that? I think the full budget was maybe a hundred grand and um so i had i think i'd done my first couple films there so i i I put in a little bit it was all my movies are out of pocket like uh and the other producer i had from the theater company they put in um yeah it was all borrowing begging from friends and family um what what was great about moon the the fact that hysterical cycle took place at this place called moon lake it may, it may after i finished i was like my my wheel started turning and i and i thought well maybe i can tell more stories at moon lake i had mm-hmm. this this crazy narrator character which is my homage it's like basically i say homage a lot basically um it's it's hitchcock on acid like i was like he's he's you know he's like this crazy uh alfred hitchcock character um and i thought well, he's the man in the moon and he could tell all of these stories that take place at moon lake mm-hmm. from the beginning of uh you know history to the future and then that became my graphic novel series moon lake and um i'll i'll, I'll email that to you if you want to check that well, out i have too. it yeah oh and no, I, I i got a copy of that yeah i i, I okay. downloaded that and i downloaded a book brooklyn gladiator as well great, which great. i now want to talk to you about because if you thought hysterical psycho was crazy open up a copy of Brooklyn Gladiator and strap in because this is like, I have to ask you what your inspirations were for this, even though I kind of have an inkling that somehow judge dread and Robocop played into it somehow. Of course. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I love all those movies. Um, this, this is my sci-fi dystopia cautionary tale. Um, yeah, it's, it's Akira in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Blade Runner in, in a lot of ways. Um, it's also Matrix, Star Wars. It's 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 got elements of all those movies. Um, what what's different about it is that the main character um, on the outside he he looks like you know John McClane meets Schwarzenegger. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the inside, he's rejecting all of the, the technocracy. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's, he's meditating, he's rejecting all the, the mind altering drugs and everything. And he's going on the astral plane and he's becoming, uh, more psychic. So this guy who looks like this, like, you know, death cage fighting, um, you know, maniac uh, fighting for his life is also um, a, a blossoming psychic. And uh, this is where kind of the, the matrixy element comes to escape from New York. If you like that, oh, he, he starts to, Yeah, he starts to notice um, everything's redacted. He just he just is searching for truth, and 
he makes his way out. He, he basically, it almost kills him to get out of America. And when he gets out of America, he lands in uh, Canada. He sees he's drafted very quickly into like the Canadian, you know, resistance. And he sees that, holy shit, the whole, the rest of the world is in the middle of World War Three, World War Four. It's like fucking, it's futuristic lasers and robots, and 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 it's at our doorstep, and America has no clue. Um, so that's that's the 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 feeling of that world, and yeah, it it's it's definitely. Uh, I, I put a lot of what I grew up watching, uh, what I love. I always do that with my work, um, and 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 it's also very close to home um, because I've been thinking about Brooklyn Gladiators since nine eleven. I was in New York when that happened, and um, I basically like felt the vibrations of the the buildings and and woke up to that, and it's been with me ever since. And so this story uh, is my. Um, going down the rabbit hole and uh, of the conspiracy world and my search for truth. And it, it's all um, taking the headlines of today and turning up the dial and seeing what is that going to look like 15, 20 years from now, mm -hmm. and then grabbing Simon Beasley who drew Lobo and did covers for heavy metal, like right, one of my right. favorite artists and was just like, go forth and make my world come to life. That was like- uh, I, I love the style too. I love just flipping through the pages as well, uh, just cause it's got that like hardcore heavy metal style to it, which yeah. is, it's very raw, but also beautifully done. Um, and specifically the coloring was is great as well. And this was something you guys, how, this came about, you, did you guys kickstart this? Is that correct? Yeah, it started off as a Kickstarter. Um, we did, I just, I put out like a volume zero, which was like a preview for the world. Right. Um, and that was the, like the original campaign. And that got us interest from publishers. And, uh, and now it's, oh my God, it's, it's found its way. It started, uh, Brooklyn Gladiators started, uh, at another place and then and, and then it found its way to to heavy metal which is like full circle so wonderful mm -hmm. that heavy metal is the first i was like 10 years old i was first starting to get into comic books i went into my brother's room and i saw his comic collection and heavy metal magazine was oversized and it was sticking out so that's the reason i, I pulled it off the yeah, shelf smart and it was that yeah, was good and it was obviously, uh, you know, it was, you know, adult and um, it made a huge impression. And then I went on to watch the heavy metal movie like a thousand fucking times. And that movie was also a huge inspiration for Moon Lake, where you have the Loch Nar yeah. weaving in through all the different anthology stories. And I thought, I want, I can do that with the man in the moon, you know? I, um, uh, yeah, I love that, by the way, that you, made a movie called hysterical psycho and then you came up with the full lore of moon lake and then you went into the comic book normally i don't know if you know this or not right. but normally they do the comic book first yeah. uh and then they 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 build from there but uh, i like that you're an innovator on that front um dan we've got to the section of the show we call the friend zone which is where uh the best friends oh. out there for the kind of funny community submit questions for you uh we have a few questions from uh our community first off it's mitch crass and he says What's it like acting on set with so many uh, magic effects are added in post? Uh, and what is the oddest thing that someone has, that a director has asked you to do uh, for, for a performance like that? And also, he says, I love your performances, William Barfy, uh, all those years ago. That's nice. It's Barfay. <laughs> um, okay, so what's it like? I'm always astonished. Thank you for your question. It's, oh, I'm always astonished that I'm basically doing what I used to do when I was a kid outside. I'm getting paid and I'm making a living what, doing what I used to do with my friends. Like, like, okay, you're Chewbacca, I'm Han Solo. There's a Sarlacc pit right here you know, on the cement and we got to swing across. Like, you know, and you do that for an hour. 
like that's what I'm getting paid for. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I'm just astonished by that. So then, you know, and and then that translates to theater, black box theater. Mm-hmm. There's you gotta you have to imagine imp- improvising. You have even less at your disposal. You don't even have these set. You know, um, all of those skills really help when you're on a green screen stage and they're saying, okay, the, the giant rhino you know, is running after you. Um, yeah. Is that, uh, do, were you, do people kind of defer to you a little bit on that stuff? Like does Eddie look over you and be like, man, you're, you're the one from, uh, from UCB. What do we do here? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a, you know what I do? I, I don't know. No one's really asked me. I mean, come on. He's an Academy Award winner. I know. I'm, I'm being facetious but, to a great degree. But, um, I, I always find like my, like Bob Hoskins did, um, you know, uh, Roger Rabbit. Right. Okay. And I think I remember him talking about like, it's all about, it's all about distance, just knowing where the guy is and just referring, just keep, you know, just keep looking at like, because when you're, when I'm, I'm not constantly looking at you, right, <laughs> you know, right. right. I'm, I'm seeing you there and I'm gesturing and I'm coming back. That sells it. All the people who are, who are just like fucking focusing their asses off on one spot. Um, that's not how you look at something. And, and so that's, it's a very, it's, it's a very subtle thing, but if you can figure out how to just make it, you know, make it natural, um, somehow for yourself. Uh, but there is a physics to it, you know, mm-hmm. don't, don't, don't stare at it. Just, just remember how you look at things in real life. <laughs> <laughs> how um, would you normally look at a thing that's alive? In a yeah. real environment, take that you, in. Yeah, a lot of people make the mistake of just looking at one spot, but really, you're looking at the whole thing. You're just like checking out the whole, and that, and then that eye movement is, is just like, wow, you can really, you can paint it in, into the into the uh, the trajectory. You know, it's mm-hmm. it, I don't know, it's little tricks. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, but it's fun, man, because the technology now is such that it used to be that you had to you know you you couldn't you can only look in this area here but um like look at the x you know follow the tennis ball like right the, it, it's so advanced now where you can um you can basically look wherever you want in the room that fits your your performance and they'll make it work for you <laughs> So for someone that's just like an improviser, you're just like, what? I'm I'm improvising like the movement of the animal now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm improvising the movement of the dragon. Like what? And you guys are gonna cool. all get together and you're gonna make that happen in CGI. You're like I have the power now. Uh, yeah, you do. You get. You get. You do. You get to dictate a lot of the. Like for instance, the first time I learned that, I was like a kid in the candy store. If you watch the first movie. The scene where um, I open up Newt's case. He's mm-hmm. where our cases are switched. And I open up his case, and the uh, the Mert lap jumps out. That whole sequence, I choreographed the whole thing. I mean, it was just like the, he jumps out. And we're all over the fucking room, and, and and I have this like squishy puppet in my hand, and I was like, "So what do you guys want me to do?" And like, "Oh no, no, we'll follow you." I was like, "Oh." Oh my god! And then I was oh my like, god, the the pressure on that. I would be like, wait, if I make the wrong move, is that going to cost a million dollars? What? <laughs> right. This but thing it, out. it was very freeing, uh, in uh, in a lot of ways, and 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 the whole the whole. I was like, can I do a thing here? They're like, please. I was like, okay. Well, how about like I look out the window and I see the the you know a rumping or whatever I'm looking at running out the window, and then so does the mert lap and then we look at each other and then he remembers and then jumps at me and they were like we fucking love it and then and <laughs> that was that's awesome yeah that's pretty crazy. special especially for I, I imagine a movie that's got a lot of constraints on it to be able to have a little bit of creative freedom for those scenes specifically for you because you, i imagine they bring you in to do those those high energy fun moments um to to juxtapose with eddie's sort of look more subdued performance um next question comes from her child 
says, as a big Star Wars fan, Fanboys is one of my personal favorite flicks, and it introduced nice. me to you as an actor. Uh, what was it like being a part of this film? Do you have any fond memories to share? Oh, man. I love Fanboys. Fanboys, I think it was like probably the first, one of the first movies I did after Spelling Bee. Um, that movie was rem like reminded me of what it was like to be a kid again. I I was collecting my comic books all through you know my high school years, Star Wars toys, GI Joes, all that stuff. I got to college and I had to pay rent, and um, there were I had to sell off a lot of my toys uh, and a lot of my stuff, sucks. and it was in my comics. Oh. And it was really quite painful. And I had to like, I made it in my mind. I was just like, okay, you're a man now. You got to pay rent. You know, it's a, it's a frivolous thing to go to the comic book store. You got to, mm -hmm. you know, you got to pay your dues now. And then I, and I, and then I got that movie and they basically said to us, here's your stipend. And we were like, great. And they were like, you know, what's rehearsal? Oh, we're going to the comic book store. You know, <laughs> we we're like, what? They're like, Done. So they were, and rehearsal was buying toys and posters and, and comics again. And that movie literally was, I was like, oh my God, I can be a kid again and I'm getting paid for it. And, um, and then I've been, I've been buying comic books uh, ever since uh, again. And uh, yeah, my, my trailer for that movie was basically a mini replica of all the posters that I had on my wall as a kid, like all the, like Zeppelin posters and like Punisher, Wolverine, fucking Hulk posters, all, like all over. And I basically bought all those same posters again. Um, and I bought a bunch of Star Wars stuff. Um, and that was the time when they, like McFarlane toys were coming out. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's a good time, up, good time to yeah. be uh, in the comic book shop for sure. Oh yeah. Updating all the Star Wars. Yeah. So that was, that was really fun, man. Yeah. That, that, that movie was, um, and any well, I mean, those are all my beautiful memories. But I guess my fondest memory was, you know, hanging out with Billy D, hanging out with Carrie Fisher, um, like the real, the real deal people. Do, do they ever get tired of people asking them? I mean, because you got to know when you're Billy D. Williams or Carrie Fisher, um, that at some point in every interaction, there's just someone's waiting to ask you a Star Wars question. Yeah, man. It's do you, like, do you think they ever get tired of it? <laughs> They're, 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 they're doing the fanboys movie that's true know? that's a good point um yeah they were good sports man um my favorite was my favorite was billy d because we were all <laughs> such a funny story we're standing around um all the guys and Kristen bell so it's basically a bunch of guys and Kristen bell you know? <laughs> and um and we heard oh gosh you know billy billy d's coming we're like, oh my God, Lando's coming. Holy shit. And we, and we were told like, you know, he's got a, he's walks with a cane, you know, he's, he's not Lando, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's just like, don't get up in his face right now. You know, we're like, no problem. No, no, no Don't try problem. to put a cape on him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're, we're all standing in a, like in a semicircle and his limo pulls up and then Billy D walks out and he is, he's, he's got his cane and he's, you know, a little frail and he's, he's standing up at a limo and everyone's real quiet and, and, we're, and he goes around to all, all the guys and he's just all, hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? And we're like, oh, Billy D, great, big fan, big fan, Billy D. And he goes around all the guys. It's all very quiet, somber, and, and everyone's just like, you know. And he gets to Kristen Bell and he turns to her and he goes, well, 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 what do <laughs> we have here? And everyone starts, we were like, yeah, it's great. And like, he puts his arm around her and he walks off. I was like, That's what amazing. the fuck? That is amazing. Amazing. He turned into Lando before our our eyes and walked off with the princess. That's I, I um, I, I mean, you you can't you can't fucking you can't you know you, you can't buy that. That's no price. That's that is a price. that is a great memory from from what you know. And I'll I'll admit I I, I had didn't actually see fanboys uh, back in the day. I, I got a chance to watch it over the weekend, and I didn't know that there was um a lot of energy surrounding that movie uh coming out oh, yeah. um and i have to ask did you ever get a, did you ever get a chance to see um the director's original cut of that that aired at the star wars celebration uh no i only heard I, I saw early early cuts um but i heard that there was that cut that they uh, they showed here in the uk i think mm -hmm. yeah 
that got a standing ovation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then, um, you know, a lot of cooks in that kitchen. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, you know, that's that's what happens. You, yeah. For people who don't you, know, the, the Weinstein Company, who was distributing the film, uh, decided to make some changes and do some reshoots unbeknownst to the original director. Um, and they did it in, a, I would say, a not so nice way to be diplomatic as far as uh, pushing their agenda, um, which is unfortunate because I think, you know, having watched it now, uh, the movie has so much heart and it looks like you guys, you can tell when people are having fun yeah. making a movie and it looks like you guys legitimately would have just kept making that movie for a while because it looks like you're having a lot of fun just hanging out and geeking out over star wars yeah um, yeah man we we had a lot we definitely had a lot of fun on set and, and that's another one we've been trying to because i do the goldbergs with 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 adam goldberg with adam, right and he wrote on it he wrote on uh on that right yeah. fanboys and fanboys. we're always talking about um Kevin Smith too uh, was dire- directs on that show as well, and I, we've been talking to Kevin. And I recently did uh, the Silent Bob reboot, and if you watch that movie, um, I'm basically playing Hutch in that movie. Oh right, you were you were um, in the at the in the con at the end, right? Yeah. So That's we're great. trying to you know we're trying to defibrillate it. We're trying to get a Dan. If you were if you were telling me there's a world in 2021 where news breaks that Balls of Fury two and fanboys too is a thing i am on board and i think all everyone listening to this podcast will be as well i think that might be the thing that brings the world back uh to reality in 2021 so please let's make this happen and uh we, we've gone a little long so i apologize i want to be oh, yeah, sensitive no, no, no. for your time um but i do want to wrap it up here and tell you thank you so much this has been awesome um sure. thank you for letting me geek out with you over balls of fury and uh sure, and man. all of your other projects and uh, uh everyone if you want to see more dan fogler of course uh, September 23rd through the 25th over on twitch.tv slash crown. You can check out Click Sport One, which I can honestly say is going to be bananas in the best possible way. Um, Dan, where else can people find you do, um, on, on the internet <laughs> or, or when they're not watching Fantastic Beasts and where to find them? Right. Uh, or, or Walking Dead or Goldbergs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot going on. Uh, okay. So uh, at Mr. Dan Fogler on Twitter, um, at Fogler's uh fictions on instagram and www.foglersfiction.com is basically like a one-stop fogler fun fantastic sensational event place perfect and also go listen to his podcast because it's amazing yeah yeah i mean you can find everything there Um, we got a (laughs) we got a podcast uh, uh um my we got a live video chat this weekend with the cast from the argument on the 26th. Oh, that's great. Uh, and then we have a really special, um, cause the walking dead is coming out on the fourth. We're having mm. the finale finally. Um, and we're doing a show on the third and we're having the cast and special guests and there's gonna be all sorts of fun, the walking dead, the spoilers and surprises. So check Beautiful. that out too. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for thank uh, you. joining us, man. This has been awesome. Dude, my pleasure. Cool, Kev. We can cut there.